Hey Joe, I hope you had a happy Mother's Day. This week I want to talk to you about one of my favorite engagement strategies. I do, we do, y'all do, you do. During the last month of school year, it can be really tough to get students to focus on what's really important uh, with the learning. It's really great for some of those more complex uh, concepts in biology. It's a pretty self-explanatory strategy, but I do want to explain it a little bit and also why I really like this strategy and then just give you some examples from my class. The I do part is just where I'm in front of the class showing the example, demonstrating the idea for them. Then the we do, that's where I'm still doing most of the work, but the students are telling me what to do or giving me the instructions. Third is the y'all do, that's where I step back and let the students work with either table partners or groups uh, where they can teach each other the material. And then finally the you do, that is usually on an assignment or on a test where students have to prove that they can do the work by themselves without any help from me or their classmates. I wanna give you a few reasons why I like this strategy. First, I feel like it gives the perfect amount of examples. I always feel like you're trying to balance between too many examples and not enough examples. If you give too many examples, students will maybe not pay attention to the first few because they always assume that there's gonna be more examples and they can learn it later. But then on the other side of the coin, if you give too few examples, then students get really frustrated and confused because they don't know the material well enough. And so kind of both of those can lead to classroom problems, either from boredom or from frustration. And so this really tries to give a good number of examples so that students really focus as much as they can on learning the material and in just the right amount of time for them to do that. Another thing I really like is because it kind of naturally differentiates the unit. Once you show it, you can start to see students differentiate how much leadership they're gonna take in the next steps based on how well they know it. Are they going to get it explained to them by someone else? Are they gonna be one of the students who's doing the explaining? They can kind of differentiate based on what they need to learn to be able to do it by themselves because they always know at the end they have to be able to do it on their own. Another thing I really like is it kind of teaches them how to self-reflect a little bit, which is a super important skill for later in life. They have to think, how much of this information do I know they have to use that thought process to decide what part they're going to do and also think about how they're going to learn enough to be able to do it by their own. They kind of take ownership of their learning, thinking about what they need to do. And then finally, I also love the peer teaching aspect where students are teaching each other. I think this is the best way students to learn is by teaching. I always think when students can think about how to explain it to someone else, they do the most learning. And also, I always think students tend to learn more when it's explained to them by their peers who can maybe use different examples or different ideas that I want to think of to explain it to them in a new way. It's always interesting kind of towards the end of the school year, once we've done this activity several times, I'll hear have classes who will just say, Mr. Tim, we can skip the we do section. We're ready for the all do. We understand it enough for us to start teaching it to each other. Or the other side where after I'm ready to go to the y'all do, they'll say, can we do a few more examples together because I don't know it enough. And that just shows them taking ownership of their learning and reflecting on how well they understand the content, which is great to see as a teacher. I always love to see that. All right, so I just wanna give you a few examples, two different examples of me using the strategy kind of in completely different ways. One is more with an activity, and then one is more kind of with just like assignment examples. So the first one is during our genetics unit, where we're talking about complex things like replication, transcription, and translation. We're talking about DNA polymerase, helicase, RNA polymerase, tRNA, mRNA, all these different molecules that are really difficult for students to keep track of in their mind. For like replication, I have paper models uh, of DNA and of the enzymes that they're gonna use. And so I'll just go through and I'll act out all the parts. Then for the we do section, the groups uh, will decide, okay, who's gonna be the helicase? Who's gonna be the single stranded binding protein? Who's going to help add nucleotides? So each kind of know their role. And again, they can pick their role based on how well they understood it from the notes and the I do part. And then for the y'all do, they just practice it two, three, four times 
Um, and when one person's saying their part, the rest of the group is listening and giving feedback. And then for the you do part, I just film them as they explain it. And then I upload those videos to YouTube so other teachers can see some of the activities we do. I can look back at things I've done in the past. But the number one reason why I upload it is so that students can use it as a study resource. The other example I want to share was just from this week when I was teaching absolute dating using the law of half-lives. I did an example in front of the board, a lot of the students kind of picked up on it pretty quick because it is pretty simple. Then for the we do, I kind of tweaked it with maybe a different element we we're looking at or a different fraction remaining. So they kind of give me the instructions of what to do as I do it. And then finally, the uh, y'all do section, they were working with their table partners with whiteboards where I put an example on the board. They would do it. Uh, if both of them were confused, they could find another group to talk to. So again, they're teaching each other. Um, understanding that they're going to have to be able to do it on the assignment and on the test. So they really kind of have that motivation to learn the concept. And then the you do um, was the assignment, and then we have a test tomorrow, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I think they'll do great because they really embrace the strategy. So for the highlight this week, I just want to talk about one of the things I did in my class which was pretty exciting. We were talking about stars, and there were five main categories I wanted them to know about stars, types of stars, stuff about fusion, uh, how large stars and small stars go through stellar evolution. Then I also wanted them to know about planet formation. So instead of me just standing in front of the class and teaching all five sections, I decided to do a little bit different, try to incorporate a little bit more student choice. Um, so I let the students choose who they wanted to work with. I let them choose which of those five topics they want to become an expert at. And I also let them choose how they were going to share that information with the class. For the first time this year, students kind of really embraced the idea and were excited to do it. And they came up with some of the best demonstrations I've seen that I thought were awesome, way better than I would have come up with. Um, the group who was doing fusion, they got paper cutouts of hydrogen atoms and they showed them combining and the extra leftover mass from the helium becoming energy. And they also like drew a Venn diagram to compare fusion and fission. We had another group who was talking about stellar evolution who used Jolly Ranchers to show dust particles in a nebula and how they come together to form a star. And then what happens when they do a supernova and the particles uh, explode is pretty awesome. I think they just wanted to eat the Jolly Ranchers, but uh, really helped kind of see them take ownership of their learning. And instead of just thinking about the material, thinking about ways that students learn best. The struggle this week is just kind of the content. Uh, we're talking things like the Big Bang Theory, um, Earth formation, history of the Earth, uh, origin of life, um, endosymbiotic theory going from simple cells to complex cells. And all of those concepts are stuff my students really struggle with. I see a lot of students who kind of want to learn the material or are kind of interested in it, but they're kind of almost fighting themselves from learning it because they're like, oh, I'm not supposed to learn this or I'm not supposed to think this, uh, which is kind of hard for me to see as a teacher. So one thing I try to do to maybe help a little bit is always focus as much as I can on the evidence. And one thing we did before we even started the unit was talk about how two people can look at the same evidence and come to different conclusions. Some people might look at evidence and say, that is enough to convince me. Other people might look at the evidence and say, it's not enough to convince me. And one life skill I really want to get across is that even if someone looks at the evidence and thinks differently than you, that they're still important and smart and have just as much value as you, even though they think differently. So I really try to focus on just because you look at the evidence and have different conclusions doesn't mean that you can't get along or be respectful to each other. So that's kind of the way I approached it. And um, I think it went pretty well, but again, there's still students who are going to struggle with some of those concepts um, that kind of maybe challenge their faith or go against what they think their parents want them to think. Um, and again, my job isn't to convince them to believe something differently. It's just to kind of teach them the evidence as to why science can explain things without supernatural explanations. The activity for the week was pretty fun. I had my students pretend they were fossil hunters. So I came up with this little activity where I had six fossils that I wanted them to find the age of. So they had to do the whole of half-lives with the ignis layers to get numbers. And they had to use a lot of superposition and relative dating to kind of estimate how old they thought the fossils were. And then we compared those dates that they came up with with their timeline activity we had done before where we talked about what time period different organisms were around in and kind of seeing how they matched up. One of my students said, Mr. Tim, yesterday when you taught us how to do this, it didn't make any sense, but now we have a hands-on activity. It all makes sense. And I was like, oh, 
you're just hitting me right in the feels there. Like that's the nicest thing you can possibly say to a teacher. So that made me feel great. Um, I'm excited to do it again next year. And I think it really helped with student learning. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Educating Joe. Uh, feel free to like, share, comment, or subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, and to all you other Educating Joes out there, have a great week teaching.